Ephesians chapter 4. Look with me at verse 1. This is a, <clears throat> this is a very important chapter in the uh, scheme of things. Uh, it's going to tell us a lot of information, but in verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. That confirms the fact that he's a prisoner of chapter 3. And the prisonership of it <clears throat> is not because he did something wrong. It's because he's a prisoner of the Lord. He, he's doing what he's supposed to do, and it's made the Jews mad at him and basically got him put in prison. And, of course, it's the leadership of the devil trying to shut Paul up from doing any missionary journeys again because he's done, uh, I think, about three missionary journeys and establishing people and churches and whatever and houses and whatever. But uh, this is this verse confirms verse chapter 3, verse 1, for this calls out Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, the therefore has to be in relationship to chapter 1, 2, and 3, especially 3, because of what he was revealing back when he uh, was separated, uh, Acts 22. Acts 28, he said, Lo, I turn to the Gentiles, which in the Hebrew letter language is a horrible thing to them. <clears throat> Gentiles were not liked by the Jewish nation and the circumcision. But he said, I, therefore, therefore, again, chapter 3, the information that's in it, 1 through 21 verses. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, and long, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And that verse 7 is very important to you. You understand the measure of grace. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. It's a measure. So God knows what he called you to do. And he knows how long you'll live. He knows where you'll be. He knows where you'll go. And so he, through Paul, lays down rules and regulations of that walking worthy of the vocation of verse 1. So I, I want to I think about that just a minute and understand that the Ephesian letter There's a great <clears throat> time of turmoil when the Ephesian letter is written. It's the first century, the book of Acts, the things that are going on. The Ephesians would be attacked just like the Colossians would be. Uh, the Colossians were told, let no man judge you in meat or in drink, because the legalizers would come in and they would be all kinds of uh, uh, wolves. As a matter of fact, hold this just so and go to Acts 20. In Acts 20, Paul describes his uh, course here. In Acts 20, verse 22, Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit under Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me. Uh, when he says, I don't. He knows, but he doesn't know. That's like, uh, I know that bonds and affliction abide me. That's what the Spirit says. But how I get them or how bad I get beat before I get them or what kind of affliction I get, I don't know. It's just going to come. He knows it's going to come. But because of what he's teaching, of course, <clears throat> that's that turmoil time of, of the transition between the revelations that Paul is getting, and he, he's getting different revelations, and as he gets them, it's different groups of people are being handled with it and understanding it, and it causes suffering and great, great affliction. But now verse 24, 
but none of these things move me. It don't it don't stop me? It don't move me to not go. Okay. Uh, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Now you can't finish a course unless you've been doing your course. So he's in in somewhere in the middle of his course, maybe. I'd finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And personally, if you study of Ephesian letter, that is the gospel of the grace of God. That's the good news that the grace of God has been extended out to uncircumcised, alien, stranger, becomes a promise on and on uh, Gentiles who had not Christ, no hope, no prophecy, uh, no tongues are going to be going on and, and everything. I mean, because of the, what the Corinthian letter said. And so it's a time when they would have to hear the good news, the gospel of their salvation, which the gospel of their salvation, the same gospel that the first people that believed heard, that was Christ died for our sins according to scripture. And he was buried and rose again the third day according to scripture. There's no other gospel that Paul preaches uh, in the sense of the power of God unto salvation. The gospel of the grace of God is not salvation. It's how salvation came for somebody to hear the gospel of Christ. But now let's read on. And now behold, <clears throat> and now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. So he's come to a point that wherever he's headed, he's not going to be back to Ephesus. He's been in, he's in Ephesus in Acts 19 and 20, and that's where he deals with the elders, which are the bishops that take up the money that's being given to the, the saints at Jerusalem who have sold out, and they're overseeing the money. That, that was the job of the bishops, and he went to Ephesus in his missionary journeys, but here he's telling them, you won't see my face anymore here in Ephesus. Wherefore, I, I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. For I have shunned not, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. And that's what they were doing. They, the Ephesians were giving. The, the, the first Ephesians were giving to <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> the saints of Jerusalem and feeding them because the Gentiles, well, such as Cornelius with, with Peter, they were never told to sell out. And the Gentiles with Paul, definitely not to sell out, but they could give to feed these saints at Jerusalem that had sold out on their doctrine. And so they uh, they were uh, over which the Holy Ghost made that you overseer. So uh, the Ephesians in Acts 19 that Paul personally knew and walked to Ephesus to see and talking to the elders, which some of them were bishops. They were overseers of feeding the church of God, which God had purchased with his own blood. Now verse 29, for I know that this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So he knows you're not going to see my face anymore. And there's going to be some wolves come in and try to disrupt this thing and try to change your ID, your ideology about what's right and wrong and try to break up the body and and so forth. And this is why the Ephesian letter in chapter four has great significance and it works today too, because there are wolves all among us now and they want to disrupt the unity of the spirit baptism of first Corinthians 12, 13, which is <clears throat> the one baptism that Paul talks about in Ephesians four, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. When we hear the gospel of our salvation and trust it, we're sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. And that spirit places us, baptizes us 
baptism, not water, it's placement. That's the word. The word baptism means placement. If you put water baptism, then it's your placement in water. But if you, there's no water on it, it's a placement somewhere. And the placement somewhere was in the body. Okay. And there would be wolves come in there and try to mess up people's mind on this and put ordinances on them and baptisms on them and you name it, whatever. And they'd come in there and verse uh, 30, also as you your, uh, your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And that's, <clears throat> that works today. <clears throat> People are always trying to uh, take men's disciples and corrupt everything and i mean they're always there they're wolves and that's quite obvious so go back to chapter four of ephesians and try to understand let's get some understanding on this why he wrote this chapter to the ephesians and remember he doesn't know these ephesians all of them now the people that he knew in ephesus are going to read the letter too but there's some at ephesus that he never met and that's according to chapter 1, verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith. He didn't know them. He had heard of their faith while he was in prison. And the Lord inspired him to write this letter, this letter to these Ephesians. Well, <laughs> again, to all Ephesians. But it was specifically hit the Ephesians he didn't know. It would give them great understanding. So we go back to Ephesians 4, 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you all worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Well, they may not have known their vocation, or they knew it, but they didn't know how to walk according to it. And Paul <clears throat> is going to give them instruction in this. So we, we think about the vocation. Now, that, that vocation is a calling. Uh, a calling to do something. Uh, if you put your resume into somebody, later on they may call you to come to work and it'll be your vocation. I mean, we use the word, uh, what's your vocation, uh, you know, or you go to vocational school, vo vocational colleges, that's to teach you different forms of work. A lot of them are automotive or <clears throat> nursing or anything like that that's the vocation well paul said i beseech you that you are worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called now there's a vocation that is for the body of christ one of the things that the church the body of christ does is in chapter 3 verse 10 to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. As we learn, <clears throat> the devil learns. Say, so, well, you think the devil knew it all. No, I think it's progressive learning in the body through the centuries for the times that are coming. Uh, I don't believe that the first people in the first century or the second century were in perilous times in the sense that we are. It's a different kind of perilous time. They all thought they were in perilous times. Obviously, the wars and the Crusades and all that, and Mussolini and, and the wars uh, of World War One, Two, and Three, the Civil uh, World War One and Two, the Civil War, all those. I mean, it looked like perilous times. But the thing we live in now in Timothy, the perilous times is that back in the perilous times that people thought they were living in, God was still, you could talk about him. You could uh, discuss with people about God and they wanted God. But right now we're in a time when people don't want God and they don't want Jesus Christ. They don't want the Bible. I mean, they really do not want the good news. So the vocation, the calling, it has a walk in it, according to verse 1. And his walk is to be done worthy. Worthy is an answerable thing. Uh, it really, in the scriptures, means answer, something you have to answer for, answerable. 
uh, you have to answer for that walk. Not in salvation, but in the walk, in the vocation. So people say, well, <clears throat> you think we'll be judged? I don't think we'll be judged. I know we'll be judged. I mean, it's in Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. I mean, there's a judgment involved there. It has nothing to do with salvation. If you go to the judgment seat of Christ, it's not about your salvation. And you already have an inheritance if you're saved. The uh, very clear look back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, uh, uh, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And there's a great thing to learn there. <clears throat> the people that died in the first century, the second, all the way down, especially in the first century, they were in heaven. And those that were on earth are being gathered together by one message. Now look at verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We're not going to work to get an inheritance. We obtained an inheritance. An inheritance is based on the adoption of Romans chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. We're adopted. So we've obtained an inheritance that our old inheritance was going to get us death. That's all it would work out. I mean, we inherited from Adam death, wherefore by one man sin in the world, death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all sin. Well, we obtained an inheritance from God, an heirship and, and an heir of God, joint heir with Christ, invited in the household of God. But right now, what we're trying to look at in the Ephesian letter is, Somebody that didn't know all of that was available has now become aware of it by somebody coming and telling them the gospel of their salvation, according to Ephesians chapter 1, <clears throat> look in verse 13. In 13, he said that, uh, in whom you also trust, that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Well, hearing in accordance with Paul's writings, preaching. Please God by the illusions of preaching to save them that believe. So somebody came to the, the, the Ephesians that Paul didn't know while he's in prison and preached to them the gospel of their salvation, which would be the gospel of Christ. Christ died for their sins, according to Scripture, was buried and rose again the third day. There was restriction early in the book of Acts of where Paul would go and who he would speak to, and the Lord hindered him from going to certain places at that time. So in his hindering them, they wouldn't hear the gospel at that time because God wasn't ready for them to hear the gospel. It's all up to God. Everything's up to God. Why, how God wants to do it and how he's going to do it, that's up to God. We let him alone there. But <clears throat> he lets people hear when he wants them to. And so they heard the gospel of their salvation and they trusted it. When they did, they believed it. They were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. And Paul had heard about their faith in the Lord Jesus. And so we go back in uh, chapter four and they, they're calling their vocation. Has to have some recognition of how. Because what worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. So let's look at some things. First Corinthians 3. We'll come back to Ephesians a lot, Ephesians 4, but first Corinthians 3. If you never <clears throat> do another thing or never do anything. For Christ, except trust the gospel of, his sal of your salvation, trust the gospel of Christ. You're sealed. And, and no matter what you do, plus or minus anything, does not affect that. That is, that's totally and completely up to the Lord. Salvation belongs to him. How you walk in that calling is up to you. And, of course, religion tells you, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't cuss. Those are not listed as things you should or worthy walks. But here's the things we got to look at. First Corinthians chapter three, verse uh, 
5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then it neither he that planteth anything, neither it he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So you have a labor. Now, Paul's labor was his course. And his course was to preach, involved in preaching the gospel. And it was laid out in a course where different things happened to him. And as they happened, it was because he was in certain places with different people. And we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that he said he finished his course. He actually fulfilled the word of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled all the suffering that was left that Jesus didn't, he suffered for our sins. He died for our sins. His spirit rose again the third day. His suffering was satisfied when the Lord took him out of hell. He, his suffering was over. <clears throat> but get that knowledge out, to get the knowledge of Jesus Christ out was going to cause somebody to suffer to tell it because, number one, the devil didn't know it. And if the devil finds out something he don't know, he don't like the deliverer. And that's just the way it is. He doesn't like the one that tells it. And so Paul's that man, and he began to suffer. He suffered from his own countrymen, the Jews, because he was going to Jews and telling them basically that, the works of the law was not their justification, that they were justified without the works of the law. He showed the Philippians that everything he had circumcised, all the things he did, he counted but dumb for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And he called him my Lord. Well, he's going to suffer because his apostleship is, he's the apostle of Gentiles. And the God this world just figured that Gentiles could only come to God through the Jews. But now there's a message that it's not through the Jews. It is through the gospel of Christ. And it, it has to be preached. And so Paul's the preacher and he's ordained. And he's, uh, matter of fact, let me give you another, hold on for Corinthians, another really good verse on this in 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter uh, one, uh, two. I apologize. First Timothy two, verse six. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time? Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore. So that's his deal. All right. Now watch. Um, there's a verse where he said, because of what he did, I, for some reason I've, it's escaped me, and I don't. I've, I got a lot of things I want to say. So he he said he suffered because of what he delivered. He suffered for who he went to and what he told them, and on and on. So his vocation, his course, was laid out like that, and he was a laborer. He planted the polished water. Uh, the planting and the watering are associated together in the sense that somebody, yes, has to plant, somebody has to water, and it might reverse the next time. Apollos might have planted and Paul watered. Watering is like adding to to let it grow. That's like establishment, okay? You can put the seed in the ground, but if you don't ever water it and it don't rain, it won't grow. It'll die. So if you put it the, the gospel out, and then you water it with other facts or other doctrinal things. See, that's why you go to Bible study, and that's why you have Bible study, and that's why you have fellowship, because people talk doctrine when they're believers, and they talk about the Lord, and you learn things from the Bible uh, fellowship, the Bible studies. You learn something that's watering you. It's, it's helping that seed in you grow so that you understand more and know more, and it helps you stand against the wiles of the devil. But go back to 1 Corinthians 3. I mean, Bible studies are not a waste of time. Bible studies are how you're being filled with the Spirit. 
Ephesians chapter 5, and you're redeeming that time to study and look and say, what do you want, God? What do you want from me? Um, you know, Peter says, Lord, we've done all you ask. What's in it for us? We should ask, Lord, what do you want us to do? That's what study is for. Lord, what do you want me to do? And I pray about it. I say, Lord, please help me to let them understand what they need to do because of the perilous times we're in. So I go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse um, set 9. For we are our laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation. Paul's a foundation layer of the truth. And he didn't lay on another man's foundation to say, well, I thought he was with Peter for a while. He was. But when the Lord separated him, Acts 13, he never laid on another man's foundation because the foundation he laid was the foundation of Jesus Christ. Died for our sins, according to scripture, was buried and rose again the third day. No man ever laid that before. He said, I never received it of a man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 11, 12. Okay, so <clears throat> here people are going to, look in verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. And, and it doesn't say works. And that's curious. Every man work, every man's work. And your work should be in harmony with the work that's laid out by Paul's instruction. Your, your work should be in harmony. In other words, the, uh, the worthiness of your vocation, the worthiness of your calling is you walk according to the rules set down for you. And you walk in the good works of the Lord. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But verse 13, every man's work should be made manifest for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built thereon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved yet so is by fire. So you don't have to worry about this judgment for losing eternal life or salvation. It has nothing to do with that. It's your work. But it's not the work judgment of Revelation 20. In Revelation 20 at the great white throne, this is the judgment seat of Christ we're talking about here. The great white throne, men's works are going to be tried to see whether they're in the book of life. We're in the book of life. And there's no doubt Paul knows that. Uh, the Philippian letter tells it. But the the, the labor, the laboring, and the, the work that he's talking about. Now, look in Romans 14. Romans 14, verse 7. For none of us live to himself, liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to him. He bought us. For to this end, even Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we all, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See, that's not the great white throne. He emphasizes that and he lets us know. Our judgment is not in Revelation 20. Our judgment is at the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 14, uh, uh, 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That account is the vocation, the walk. Give an account of, the, of, of himself to God. Let us therefore judge, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Okay, so there you got the judgment seat of Christ, the identification of it, and you got to give an account there at the judgment seat of Christ. All right, now look with me in Ephesians 2. <clears throat> in Ephesians 2, all right, in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, on this verse, Lodge it in there. Think about this. In Ephesians 2.10. Okay. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. 
created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so God made some good works. I always talk about, somebody says there is none good, and I'll say there is, there's none good, no, not one. Good works are there's none that doeth good, and there is none good. So how do you do good works? The good works are what he did. And it's ordained that we should walk in them. We walk in his good works. Now, as we walk in his good works, look in Titus, in Titus chapter three. Okay, I bought that uh, renegade Jeep and it was new. I can make payments on it, hope it lasts. Treat it as good as I can, get it serviced, got it serviced the other day, first service. Tires rotated and all that. And that's called maintenance. All cars have to have maintenance. If you don't do maintenance on cars, they'll break. They're just metal. <laughs> metal has fatigue, metal quits, things quit on them. Say, so, well, dang it, my car broke down. Well, why is it broke down? Well, something gave up. Say, so, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, get it fixed. Maintain it. Don't just let it sit there because it won't run. Maintain the thing. Well, let's see if there's a word called maintain in the Bible. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Maintain good works. If maintaining is taking care of something that exists, then the good works exist and we're to maintain them. We're to keep them right. And that would be by the vocation, the walk. Keep them right. Keep those works right. Um, um, look in Philippians. Look in the book of Philippians. There's something there I was thinking about, maybe. Philippians chapter 3. No, Philippians 4. A maintain it, a maintenance here. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is nigh thee. He's always with us. The Lord is at hand. It could come any time. The Lord decide to take us up. Or it might be your last day and, and uh, the Lord is at hand. He, he's never going to leave you alive or dead. Uh, if you're sealed by trusting the gospel of your salvation, then you're sealed and, and the Lord is at hand. He's always there, but he's in you. And so in him being in you, you walk in his good works and give him the glory by what you say and do in the sense of what does the Bible say? You don't have to go around saying, I believe. Say what the Bible says. This is what the word of God says. I found that if I, I try to preach what it says. Uh, I read the Ephesian letter a while ago. And as I was reading it, there's a lot of things in there that people don't want to speak about. Because, I mean, there's some things in there that are really revelation. There's no prophecy in Ephesians. It's a revelation. And so it's something new besides what you've been reading in the Old Testament and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Acts and Romans, whatever. I mean, it's totally new. It's revelation. So you have to read it word for word. Pronouns, conjunction, junctions, I call them hands, and bys and fours and throughs. You, know, you read those words and you don't want to make it what you want it to say. You want it to say what it says. And sometimes when you preach what it says, that's what makes people mad because they don't want that because it doesn't really go with their doctrinal teaching. The Ephesian letter is an incredible letter. The Colossians also. But in, in Philippians 4, 6, be careful nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which path all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The maintaining of good works, 
this would help in your maintenance. Uh, the other day when I had the oil change, like I said the first time, I didn't know what the oil recommendation got the book out. The book tells you what to maintain with. And of course, it's like 030 or 020. I don't know. I can't remember whatever they put in the, the Chevrolet dealership. And <clears throat> I watched him do all this. And he told me exactly how many quarts he was putting in and what he was putting in and everything. And he really liked the car. I said, yeah, it seems to be a pretty good car so far. I hope it holds up, but I'm going to try to maintain it. Well, the same thing, maintaining good works. You try to keep what the Lord did and what the Lord wants you to do about that always in your heart and mind. Now, let, let's look at something. Look with me in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, where we've been reading. You're to walk worthy of the vocation, wherever you call. So the calling, you worthy walk, all right? Verse 2. One of the great things he follows up with the, the walking worthy is, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. And, of course, the love of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that one died for all, then we're all dead, and they which, and I, I, I'm, I, don't, I might misquote this, so I'm going to read it. 2 Corinthians 5, 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So our worthiness is, as we, as we do this, in Ephesians 4, <clears throat> instead of always angry or trying to cut somebody down or make them feel bad, it's with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, the love of Christ. I mean, if Christ loved me, then I know he loves you. And if he loves you, then I know he loves me because we're all the same. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. So lowliness and meekness, long suffering is, is how we walk. And the forbearing, the word is curious. It says forbearing in verse uh, two, that, that means to hold oneself back. It's like, don't get even or don't try to make somebody feel bad, especially if you're feeling bad. Don't try to make somebody feel bad to make you look good. It's a forbearing. It's, it's to hold back when you'd like to just lash out. It, uh, I, uh, with me, I'll put me as an example. Sometimes I want to just turn loose and tell people where to go. People all the time doing things to me and, and whatever, and I wanted to, but to hold back, forbear. And I, one of the statements I use a lot, and if you've heard me, you know I use it, and it helps me is that we won't know the difference 100 years from now. I won't know the difference. I'd be dead and my, whatever I had against somebody or whatever I was mad about would be long forgotten. But I forbear, especially brethren, were to, were to love the brethren above all. And have great fellowship with them. And uh, you love somebody even without liking the way they are personality-wise or something. If you love them in the Lord. But um, this, uh, go, go back to Ephesians 4.3. Endeavoring. Now that's curious. Endeavoring is to like make speed at something. It's... Uh, um, the movie Ford versus Ferrari. Ford was in a great hurry. They haven't had, they had never been able to beat Ferrari in the 24 hour or whatever. And they were in a big hurry. They wanted to build something that would beat them. And the first car they built, they had a smaller engine in it. And the test driver, driver who was a, a great driver who won the 24 hours of Le Mans or whatever it was. He actually 
come back and said, this car won't beat Ferrari. It ain't got enough power. And so the, to make speed, they got to get an engine. Well, Ford had already put a 427 in there, which was a monster engine in that little GT. And he drove that and he said, this can beat Ferrari. So they endeavor to get it in there. They speed it up. That's to make haste, to, to go, endeavor. Okay, so it's a work. And the endeavorance here is to keep the unity of the spirit and the modern peace. And, and he's going to go through the ones here in this chapter. In Ephesians 4, we call it the one chapter because he lists the ones. But endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. Now go with me and watch. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, or whether it be bond or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit. We all go in the body the same way. How do we go in the body? We have to hear the gospel. We have to have it preached to us. It please God by the foolishness preaching, say them believe. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish. Foolishness put unto us which are saved is the power of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it. Romans 1 16. For, uh, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. And in that gospel is revealed the righteousness of God, which unless a person sees the righteousness of God the way Paul revealed it, he's going to have a hard time especially when people, the wolves come in and they'll tell him, yes, Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. He died for your sins. He was buried, rose again, third day. but you're going to have to confess your sins when you commit them. And that's perversion. And that is a wolf coming in and not keeping the unity of the spirit. You did not go in the body by being good. You did not go in a body by quitting sinning. You did not go in a body because of water baptism. You went in the body by one spirit, and the only way you get that spirit is to hear the gospel of your salvation. You hear that gospel, you trust it, and by one spirit, that one spirit, which is going to be listed down here in the chapter, that one spirit baptizes you. It places you in the body. Colossians said we were baptized with him with the baptism that Jesus had, and it was death. He said in, when he was 33 years old, three years after he was baptized, he said in, Matthew, in Luke 12, 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and that was death. He was going to be placed into death. We were placed into death with him. He was going to be buried and rise again the third day, and we rose with him. And if we can trust that to be enough, to satisfy God, then the spirit places us into, again, the one body, which comes up in this chapter also. So we're endeavoring uh, things like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're to endeavor to speak the same thing, have the same mind and same judgment, and all, not causing contention and divisions and problems like in that. Uh, or not to be foolish, like the Galatians in Galatians 3 and, and Galatians chapter 5. Uh, they had been, they had heard the word of faith and supposedly believed it. Then somebody came in and told them, well, you need to get circumcised to make it more effective. Uh, you know, I think about the evangelists tell you that they'll tell you that Christ died for the sin of the world. He was the lamb of the coy, the sin of the world. And on and on, and, but then you got to do something with that. I told you, if you don't do nothing ever but trust it, you're still sealed. And if you went to the judgment seat of Christ because of that, and you would, you just have to answer for not doing anything with it. But you wouldn't be answering for, I don't know you. He did know you. Or you wouldn't be at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what the seal is about. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And so you, you go up there and you hadn't done anything. You never done a, you never turned a lick on any, trying to try to labor on anything, try to get the word out, uh, anything your vocation was called for. I mean, you know what you can do. 
the vocation where you're called, you know what you can do that some people can't do. And if you don't want to do that, you're not going to lose your salvation, but you're going to be judged for the labor you didn't or did do. That's the way the judgment is. And if your labor, and it, and it does go back to the, the uh, thing where the Lord talked about a man, he hired out the whole day for a penny, and then later on in the morning, uh, the, the vineyard man or whatever he was, hired another man for a penny for the rest of the day. And then at the noon, they hired another, and then maybe in the afternoon, hired another. And they're all getting the same pay, and it made the first guy mad. I had somebody say to me one time, they said, uh, I told him I witnessed to my father when he was dying, and he had peace when he left this world, so maybe he got it. And they said, you know, it's not really fair. You get saved on your deathbed. When I had to, I got saved 20 years ago and I had to live in this world and all that. And I said, it's not fair that you got saved. It's not fair that any of us got saved. That's silly. Who cares whether you got it right before you died and you're taking your dying breath and you just trust the Lord, boom, you get sealed or you've been sealed for 40 years. What difference does it make? Say, well, I have more to answer for. Well, you had more possibility of reward. You understand? It might be that the man trusts uh, on his deathbed. He won't get a a reward likened to the man that labors. He gets all spiritual blessings. I understand that. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings. But blessings are not reward. The reward is for labor. And so if you're saved and you're alive, labor. And find out your vocation. Whatever your vocation is, walk worthy of it. And as you walk worthy, don't be tossed to and fro and and don't be foolish and, and bear up against the ones that are trying to corrupt the simplicity of crimes. Uh, Romans 16, you're to mark individuals that cause division, offenses contrary to the doctrine you've learned and avoid them. In Philippians chapter three, you're supposed to mark them. Um, let me show you this in, in uh, Philippians. A lot of times people don't talk about this one, but in Philippians chapter three, look with me in verse... Uh, 17, he said, brethren, be ye false together of me and mark them which cause, uh, mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Uh, if, if I teach you the Apostle Paul's writing, you're to mark me as a good uh, individual, not a one that uh, uh, should be avoided and, and kept away from. Uh, I always wondered about why people left the Bible studies did they leave on flesh or did they leave on thinking something else doctrinally? Because my doctrine, I try to put my doctrine right down the line with Paul and I don't have an agenda to draw you away from something that you shouldn't be drawn away from. I don't try to break up people's Bible studies. I don't try to break up people's relationship with people. I don't try to do any of that. But you think about this. There are people that will break up assemblies. They were people that cause problems in assemblies, which causes breakups and splits and all that. And that's not endeavoring. And that's not working, uh, walking worthy of the uh, uh, vocation. But Philippians, you to mark somebody that makes it to where you're following Paul. That's a good mark. Um, you're to let people be accursed, according to Galatians chapter one, if they, they come and preach another gospel or anything else. Uh, matter of fact, before I, I get ready here in Galatians chapter one, look what Paul says. He didn't say make them a curse. He said, let them be a curse. In Galatians chapter one, verse uh, six, I marveled your soul soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a cursed. Let him be a cursed. Don't make him a curse. Let him be. He's a cursed. As I said before, so say now again, if many any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be a cursed. And if you look at this, it'll go angel um, or, let's see, we. If Paul was to change his mind, it wouldn't have worked. He'd let him be a cursed. 
I mean, Paul's going to preach what God wanted him to preach, and it's written down, and it's inspired and written down in the in the canon of the scriptures of the Bible. And I'm not about to make or, or let Paul be accursed because he didn't change the doctrine. And you understand, if you go and you try to split Paul's letters up with a different gospel, then you're you're being accursed. There's one gospel for all the power of the Roman Philemon, but there are different things that are laid out to them to do. And of course, we try to teach you that too. But uh, one other thought, we're to walk in wisdom. We're to set our affections on things above Colossians 3, 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're to walk in wisdom, Colossians chapter 4. We're to redeem the time in Ephesians chapter 5. And look with me in Ephesians 5, verse 19. I'll shut up. Ephesians 5, 19. And I use this on myself and I fail, but it's what I'm going to teach you and hope you don't fail as bad as I do because I'm a failure in this Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord, heart to the Lord, instead of cursing and belittling people, belittling them, talking about them and all that. Put, your, put some things in your heart of singing psalms and melodies and change the attitude of yourself to where you're not as angry towards people. And I know it's a hard thing because I, I fight it all the time. Anger is there. I'm angry with the government. I'm angry with this and I'm angry with that. But if I would spend my time with 19, it would really be better for me. The Psalms, there's 150 Psalms and it'll have everything that's in your life probably in it. If you read them and the Psalms are, are beautiful letters uh, of verses that David wrote and David had a lot of trouble in his life and the Psalms speak of it. And so if we're thinking on the Psalms, it shows us that we're not the only one with problems that believed in God. And David was a man after God's own heart, but yet he had a lot of serious problems. And that helps me because I have problems and I have attitudes and I have things about me. And he, he instructs us here that this would help us a lot if we do it because in the fact of verse 16, redeeming the time, be not unwise, but be understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, where is the excess, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. There was a song came on a store the other day and I was just singing along with it. I kind of, I mean, I knew it was one of my 60s songs. And I get people will walk by and they look at me like, what's the matter with that dude? He's singing there, an old, old guy singing, whatever. But I was feeling good. I wasn't thinking about the prices of the food or the prices of gas or the horrifying news put on the airway and all that. I was thinking about something else. And uh, it wasn't a spiritual song, don't get me wrong, but I remember years ago that a, a lot of songs on the radio people thought were spiritual weren't. Uh, Harry Krishner was in one song that they thought My Sweet Lord was a great spiritual song. That was George Harrison uh, giving praise to Harry Krishner, his guru or whatever. I mean, the relig religious stations were playing that like it was a spiritual song. That wasn't a spiritual song. It had nothing to do with it. And on and on, but I, I just uh, I just want you to understand walk worthy of the vocation where we called, and you may have to change some things in your life, but as you do, more peace will come to you. Amen. Amen.